Okay, we're going to continue our discussion of um, stationary time series analysis by talking a little bit about serial correlation. Now, in the last um, lecture, we talked a lot about some of the characteristics of time series in general, um, that dynamic nature of a time series, and how that means we've got to get a little more complicated than just simple linear regression. Um, that we may have things like lags and leads and, and things that essentially bother some of our assumptions that we make um, that determine that OLS is blue or the best linear unbiased estimator. So we want to talk about one of those. And when we think about these you know, previous observations affecting the present observation, that leads us to something called autocorrelation or more generally what we call serial correlation. And that's when we have our observations are related to one another. Or within a model, it can be our air terms are related to one another. And so that's a problem we want to deal with. We also talked about that, that sum function that we've been using from JTools that's just such a great function, especially for cross-sectional type analysis, may not quite work here because it's not necessarily giving us access to the right variance-covariance matrix or the right correction to our standard errors. So the robust standard errors might not be quite the right ones. Um, or it's not necessarily the, the wrong ones. It's just that I think we can do better ones. Okay, so we're going to talk about serial correlation here. And next. Okay, so all right, I know. I told you in the beginning of the class I was going to try to keep the math to a minimum. And that's not keeping math to a minimum, isn't it? That's like big and nasty. But Let's just break this down really, really quickly. All this is saying is basically when we have a series YT, if I want to know what the kth level or the um, k period autocorrelation is or the kth order autocorrelation, um, and auto just with itself and correlation, so correlation with itself is I'm going to look at the current observation compared to k periods before observation. So let's say this is R1. What am I looking at? I'm looking at how correlated is the current observation with the previous observation. Okay, that's, that's the basic idea. For R2, okay, it's how correlated is the current observation with two periods ago. And then of course, if we're going to look at R2, we should also look at D2. Okay, no, that's a bad joke. No, there's no D2. That was a robot. Just a joke. Okay. So here's a way to look at um, autocorrelation. It's kind of a funky way. I don't think I've noticed anybody else who's thought to do this, probably for good reason, because it's just absolutely probably bat stuff weird. But what the heck? It seemed like a neat way to kind of visualize it. Um, so we're going to look here. We're going to pull out from our 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 Oaken's law data. Now, if you don't know where the Oaken's law data or what Oaken.ts is, just go back and look at the previous um, lecture and we talk about that. That's where it's defined. Um, we're going to pull out the growth rate and we're just going to save that as a vector. Um, and we're just doing that for convenience. Then we're going to make uh, we're going to start a matrix. And I probably don't need to start a brand new matrix here. I could probably just do it with the growth dot rate, but I did it that way anyways. Um, and then we're going to use a for loop. Okay, what a for loop does is it says, okay, do this, then take this variable, in this case L, and update it once. So start out with L equals 1, do it. Then make L equal 2, then do it. Then make L equal 3 and do it. Then make L equal 4 and do it. Um, I think R's um, notation for um, a for loop is actually pretty cool. It feels a little different to me, but it's actually overall, I think, pretty darn cool. Um, it says for everything inside this series or inside that list, and this is just one, two, three, four, so it's a vector of one, two, three, four, um, do this stuff. And I tell it what stuff to do by putting it inside curly brackets. All right, so easy peasy lemon squeezy. Let's talk about this a little bit more. Now what am I doing? I'm going to take and I'm going to lag. 
Now this is where that dynamic LM comes in so nice because that big L function that's inside of that does this automatically for you. Um, and so that's kind of nice that you don't have to do it by yourself, but here we're going to do it by ourselves. Um, and that big L function, I think, only works with inside the dynamic lag function. So, you know, eh. Okay, in any event, so we're going to leave that there and we're going to make a new column, all right, with the first lag. So we've got G and then we're going to take and we're going to use C bind. And so basically what we have is we have a vector of G. Then we're going to create a vector of, so there'll be an NA here and G minus one, GT minus one. And then we do it again. And we're just going to stick it on. So what C bind does is it combines the columns. So instead of stacking it up, so it have a whole bunch of rows, that's what R bind would do. It's sticking them together. So there's a whole bunch of columns. Um, and that's going to create a matrix that has G. All right, so this is GT. Um, gt minus 1, gt minus 2, gt minus 3, and gt minus 4. All right, so that's what they are. And then, okay, I'm going to take and turn g into a data frame because my next function needs a data frame. And then I'm going to use, this is from the psych package, pairs panels. And I really like this plot. I like it a lot. Um, what it does is in the upper triangle, it's giving you all the different co pairwise correlations. In the bottom triangle, it's giving you all the pairwise um, um, scatter plots. And so it's kind of neat to be able to see how this looks and how the, the scatter plot is. We can see there's not a huge amount of serial correlation here. There's a bit. So one lag before, 0.5, that's a fair amount. Two lags before, that's a fair amount. Um, three lags before, a lot less. But then it goes back up for four lags before, and that kind of makes some sense because on one hand, we kind of expect some serial correlate or some 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 what we call um, seasonal variation in GDP data. You know, every fourth quarter you've got Christmas and stuff like that. But on the other hand, we're using seasonally adjusted data, which is supposed to take that out, but maybe it doesn't quite get all of it. So it's not a huge amount of correlation, but you can see one year previous, there's a little more correlation than, say, just three periods previous. That kind of makes some sense. Tells us that, yeah, our, serial, our, our seasonal adjustment methodology works, but maybe it's not entirely perfect. And then you can kind of come down here and see the, the scatter plots for each one. And I think that's kind of cool. Um, I don't know that you would actually ever really do that. Um, often, but um, it's still kind of a fun way to way to look at it and see it at least for the first time. So let's look at a little more common way of looking at this, and that's with a correlogram. All right, and so we're going to use the function ACF, and we're just simply going to pass ACF um, our growth rate. All right, so we just access it right there from growth, and we tell it that's what we want. Um, and then it's going to go ahead and plot for us the correlogram. Okay, so it starts out here with zero lag. So it correlated with itself. All right, so G has a perfect, you know, the growth rate has a perfect correlation with growth rate. I mean, because it's the same variable, so it's going to be one. And then it comes down from there. So this is the first lag, second lag, third lag, fourth lag. Now, wait a minute. Why does this say one? Well, because I don't think it does it. I don't like the way this is labeled. First of all, it says this is lags, but that's not what it has labeled here. Um, this is periods. So that's year one. That's one year previous. That's two years previous. That's three years previous. So one year previous is four lags because it's quarterly data, right? So one, two, three, four. Um, so I think that's a really confusing way of labeling this plot, but that's what the way it comes out. Uh, and so each one of these is one lag. And don't let it worry about you too much. It gives you these kind of dots here. 
basically if you go outside of those dots you can say hey that correlation is high enough to be considered something we should think about in terms of whether or not there's serial correlation in the data or not um, and i will kind of use serial correlation and autocorrelation interchangeably serial correlation is a slightly more general term than autocorrelation but frankly the difference between the two is beyond the scope of this class so we're not going to worry about it we can see in these two maybe there's some cause to be concerned that there's a little bit of um, serial correlation at least in two lags maybe oops let me get rid of that okay so well that's great but what if i'm trying to look at a model well i can do the same thing with the air terms and this what i have here is just uh if we rewrote this using that previous notation that we saw with the yt's only with all the et's and put it all together and and, and use some um matrix multiplication, all that stuff, we get this, all right? So this is just algebraically equivalent to the other one. Um, it's just because we know it's ET, we can do it this way, and it, it just it's just a simplified version of it. Um, and, well, it's just a correlation between the residual in time period T and the residual K periods before that. That's all we're, we're doing. So we don't even really have to worry about that too much because you know what? The computer's going to take care of it. So let's do that. We're first of all, we're going to estimate a model. And in this model, we're going to put in our difference in unemployment. So that D calculates the difference. And so poof, it does it right for us. And then we're going to put in here lags of um, GDP growth. And we're going to go from 0 to 3. And we're just going to use uh, the Oaken time series data set. Okay, easy peasy, so nothing too fancy there. And then we're just going to get the residuals from that model. That's all we're doing. We're using this RESID that just returns the residuals in a nice convenient way. We're going to pass that to the ACS, ACF function or the get the correlogram, and then we're going to plot it. And of course, the first one is always going to be equal to 1 because, you know, the errors in time period T are perfectly correlated with the errors in time period T because they're the same series. Um, and then we look back and we see, eh, there's not a huge amount of worry about serial correlation here. Maybe one lag. All right, at least according to, you know, the ACF plot. Now you might be saying, well, wait a minute, that's not the most formal way of doing it. Yep, yeah, you're right. So maybe we should think about testing for serial correlation. And to do that, we're going to use the Bush Godfrey test for serial correlation. This comes right out of our package LM test. And all we have to do is pass to it um, this BG test, this Bush Godfrey test. Um, we pass to it our model. We tell it what the order of the serial correlation we think is. So, how far back do we think the, um, there's a significant correlation between our error terms? All right. In this case, from the a from the uh, the correlogram or the autocorrelogram, we think one lag is probably sufficient. Okay. Um, type I would just leave that F because it's either an F test or a chi squared test. For right now, we're just going to leave that as an F test. And fill when I lag, I end up creating um, missing variables. Um, and it says, do I leave those missing or do I put zeros in for them? And I just say put fill equal NA, which means they'll leave them missing. Okay. So that's easy enough. We just do that. We run the test and we find that we reject the null hypothesis. Well, here's the big thing I have. I, I would rather it told me what the null hypothesis was because it's easy to mix up, you know, this way or that way, but it doesn't. So... What's my null hypothesis here? The null hypothesis is no serial correlation. So we actually reject the null hypothesis of no serial correlation. Okay, so let's do this again. Um, and that's not entirely unexpected because we did see some serial correlation, some possible serial correlation in um, GDP, um, the GDP growth rate. And we did see one lag that had, you know, the first lag did have a higher degree of correlation. So that's one way to do this. Another way to think about this order 
is to set it up. Usually if you're going to have serial correlation for economic data, it's going to be within a year. Um, so you can either do the number of periods in the year so that you go one year back, or sometimes I like to go a year and a half back, you know, just so for quarterly data six, but here four I think also works, um, especially based on the correlogram. We can look at both or we can just go ahead and say, okay, let's do a period or a period and a half back, worth, or not a period, or one year or one year and a half, either one. Um, and that's just a rule of thumb. I don't have any good um, econometric theory behind that. It's just that generally thinking, you usually see these kinds of things happen within a year. Um, though I can show you some evidence of processes where that just doesn't hold. So, um, you know, maybe both and is a good idea. But we're just going to pass everything the same. The only thing we're changing is this. And it can we reject the null hypothesis of no serial correlation. So here we know there is um, there is evidence to support that there is um, some serial correlation in a model of up to order four. Okay, so great. We got serial correlation, now what? Oh, well, crumb, we have to figure out what to do. Well, there's a couple things to do. Number one, very similar to the, the case when we had um, heteroscedasticity, try to find out why we have serial correlation. There are possible reasons for it, like, for example, um, our functional form is wrong, or we're missing variables, or stuff like that. So if you can fix it, fix it. Right, because what serial correlation is really strongly telling you is there is pattern in those residuals that you're throwing away. There's information there that you should be grabbing up that you aren't, that you're leaving behind. All right, say we've done all that, now what? Well, here's the problem. Just like with heteroscedasticity, when our errors are serially correlated, then that means, number one, we've got um, efficiency problems, so in other words, our, our estimate, our OLS estimate, right, it's no longer best. But also, it means that our standard errors are wrong. And that's the big thing. It means our standard errors are wrong. And if our standard errors are wrong, then, well, that's a problem, all right, because that affects all of these tests. And like I said, with JTools, when we use robust, it's actually using heteroscedasticity consistent. Um, um, variance covariance matrix um, and here we have serial correlation and or serial or auto correlation and so there's actually a little bit better methodology for doing it um, so we're going to actually leave behind J tools when we get into time series and we'll, we'll have to do things a little more manually um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use something called the sandwich package I don't know why it's called sandwich but it is a cool name what the heck it's a cool name don't know why it's called sandwich, but hey, what the heck. Um, and inside of that, there's a function called kernel hack. Now, there's a number of different ways to do this, and sandwich does a number of different ways. I'm not going through all of them. I'm going through the one that I think is the best. Um, and it's not just me who thinks this is the best. This actually comes out of some research, especially from um, a couple of um, econometricians by the name of Stock and Watson, um, who've done tons and tons of work in this area um, and they've actually got some some very recent work in this area that suggests there might be even a little bit better than what we're doing here but for within the scope of this class this is uh, in my opinion the best way to go um, though I will say this these different methodologies there's not a huge amount of difference between them so you know if you just use the default um settings for kernel hack it would not be you know you wouldn't get an f on the assignment you know it just instead of an a plus plus you'd get an a plus all right but here kernel hack and then we're going to use we're going to pass to that our model and then we're going to ask two more things number one is the kernel okay i'm not going to go into all the mathematics behind um using kernels in this this area or even what a kernel is I'm going to say this, though. Um, this is one of the settings needed for this particular methodology. And we're going to set it to quadratic, or what's called a quadratic spectral kernel. Okay. 
Um, there's really two big ones to be used here. There's a Bartlett's kernel and then a quadratic spectral kernel. Kind of the theory says that Bartlett should be optimal, um, but in finite samples, some Monte Carlo simulation that's been done, particularly by Stock and Watson, have shown that the quadratic spectral kernel may have a slight performance advantage. Okay, so we're going to use the quadratic spectral kernel, and then we're going to use an Andrews automatic bandwidth. So we just set that to BW Andrews. So BW equals BW Andrews. Um, and when we do that, we get these, we get a matrix here, and that's going to be our variance covariance matrix. So we have all of our, uh, we have the variance and the covariance of all of our different um, estimators in there, and that's going to estimate that for us. So we leave that there. Then we come down here, and, we, and instead of using sums, we're going to use the conf test command. Okay, and conf test. We're going to use this um, um, argument, VCOV, and we're going to set that equal to, and we use dot equals here, are the, the hack variance covariance matrix that we did. Hack is heteroscedasticity autocorrelation consistent um, variance covariance matrix. All right, and so the really the difference in notation here is that little dot, and we need to put that in there. And I put the whole thing in parentheses so that even though I stored it in that object, it's still going to print out and I get here. And what I have here is my estimates, which are unbiased, but um, maybe not. Maybe there's something else out there that could give me a smaller standard error. Um, with heteroscedasticity autocorrelation consistent standard errors and reliable hypothesis testing. Okay. Let me get rid of my stuff. And we can then go along and we can use the stargazer function to go ahead and um, print this out. So what we're going to do is we're going to do two different models. Um, both of them basically they're the same model. It's going to be this dynamic lin, but the difference is in model one, we're going to use the regular standard errors. In model two, we're going to use the um, heteroscedasticity autocorrelation consistent standard errors. Um, if you need, if you need to do this and you want help with this notation, just let me know. I set type equal to text because I want it to print out here um, in in a nice ASCII text type format, and that gives us here. And you can we can compare the standard errors. So the hack standard error here is a little bit smaller. It's about the same, a little bit smaller, about the same, a little bit bigger. Um, and notice one thing that Stargazer by default puts the constant at the bottom, which I find weird, but you know, hey, it's, it's all good. And the only thing I'm going to say about this is this F statistic is not based on the, um, uh, the, the the hack standard errors. It's error the it's just a, a regular F statistic. So um, no adjustments been made there for serial correlation. So we have to be a little bit careful interpreting that one. 